The Boeing 377 Stratocruiser was supposed to change air travel in the 1950s with its bold design and luxury features, but instead it became one of Boeing's biggest letdowns. It looked impressive, but constant engine problems, high costs, and poor sales turned it into a commercial flop. So, how did such a promising plane go so wrong? After World War II, the world was ready for a new chapter in air travel. Airlines wanted planes that could fly farther, carry more passengers, and do it all in comfort. Boeing's answer was the 377 Stratocruiser. It was based on the military C-97 Stratofreighter, which itself came from the famous B-29 bomber. Boeing took that rugged military design and gave it a luxurious twist for the commercial market. The Stratocruiser was designed to impress. It had a pressurized cabin, something rare at the time, and could carry between 55 and 100 passengers depending on the layout. Inside, there were sleeping berths, a proper galley for meals, and even a downstairs lounge area. It felt more like a flying ocean liner than a regular plane. On paper, it looked like the future of long-haul travel, but in reality, it had problems. The engines just couldn't keep up. The plane used four massive Wright R3350 piston engines, the same kind used in wartime bombers. They were loud, unreliable, and burned too much fuel to be practical for long-distance passenger flights. The plane burned a lot of fuel, flew slower than expected, and ended up being expensive to operate. What started as a bold idea quickly ran into real-world limits. The Boeing 377 was built during a time when aircraft design was shifting from war to peace. Like many planes of that era, it borrowed heavily from military technology. Its body was based on the C-97, a military transport plane. But while the C-97 was built to haul cargo and troops, the Stratocruiser was supposed to carry paying passengers in comfort. It was a big aircraft for its time, with a fuselage almost 40 meters long and wings just as wide. But behind its size and sleek look was a serious problem. Boeing used many parts from its older military planes instead of designing new ones for commercial use. That choice hurt the 377's chances from the start. The engines were the biggest issue. The Stratocruiser used Wright R3350 radial engines, originally built for bombers. These engines were powerful but hard to maintain and often overheated. They also burned a huge amount of fuel. For airlines, that meant expensive long flights, frequent repairs, and unreliable service. What worked in wartime just didn't make sense in peacetime passenger travel. The next challenging part was the assembly. Once the design of the Boeing 377 was finalized, the next step was building it. And that proved just as difficult. The Stratocruiser was assembled at Boeing's large factory in Renton, Washington, a facility that had seen plenty of action during World War II. But this plane was different. It was huge, complicated, and packed with features that needed careful attention during assembly. The 377 had a unique double-deck layout. The upper deck was where the luxury lived, plush seats, sleeping berths, and a full galley for hot meals. Down below was the main passenger area, more standard but still roomy for its time. It was designed to feel like a flying hotel, not just a way to get from point A to point B. But packing all that luxury into a single aircraft came at a price. The plane was heavy, and the engines were outdated. That made it slower and far less fuel efficient than its rivals. The cabin layout also caused issues. A steep, narrow staircase connected the two levels, which looked elegant on paper but was awkward in real life, especially in emergencies. By the time the first planes were finished, it was already clear. The Stratocruiser looked beautiful but wasn't built to win in the long run. One of the Stratocruiser's most significant flaws was its engine. Powered by the Wright R3350, the aircraft was equipped with four of these massive radial engines. These engines were used in bombers and transport aircraft during the war, but had a reputation for being prone to mechanical failures. In the context of commercial aviation, the Wright R3350 was inefficient and notoriously difficult to maintain. While the engines were powerful, they were prone to overheating, difficult to maintain, and far too fuel-hungry for efficient commercial use. This made the Boeing 377 a challenging aircraft to operate. Airlines found it difficult to keep the planes in service for long periods of time, as engine failures often led to costly repairs and downtime. Moreover, the fuel consumption of the aircraft was much higher than that of its competitors, meaning that the plane was expensive to maintain and operate. Before the Boeing 377 could take passengers, it had to go through testing. And that's where the problems really started to show. 
During early flight tests, the Stratocruiser ran into constant mechanical issues. The engines were unreliable, the pressurization system often failed, and the plane struggled to perform as expected at higher altitudes. Boeing's engineers worked hard to fix the problems. They made adjustments to the weight, tried to improve fuel usage, and fine-tuned the engines. But the core issues remained. The plane couldn't hold its cruising speed over long distances, and it burned through fuel much faster than promised. These were serious red flags for airlines. Still, the plane passed enough tests to earn certification and began flying commercially in 1949. But once in service, the truth became hard to ignore. The operating costs were too high, the maintenance was constant, and passengers didn't find the luxury touches worth the extra hassle. What looked like an exciting new chapter for air travel quickly became a costly disappointment for the airlines that bought it. Then it all started to fall apart. In the end, the Boeing 377 just couldn't keep up. Only 56 of them were ever built, a small number for such a big idea. Even with its luxury features and bold design, the Stratocruiser turned out to be too expensive to run. Airlines quickly realized that it cost more to fly and maintain than it was worth. Compared to newer aircraft like the Douglas DC-6 and the Lockheed Constellation, the 377 felt like old news. Those planes were faster, more fuel-efficient, and much easier to work with. The Stratocruiser's reliance on outdated engines and its poor performance on long flights meant it was soon pushed aside. By the early 1950s, airlines were already retiring it. A few planes stuck around for a while longer, but the excitement faded fast. The Boeing 377 had promised a lot but couldn't deliver. In the race for the future of air travel, it was left behind by smarter, sleeker, and more reliable aircraft. The Boeing 377 was created during a time when aviation was shifting from war to peace. Boeing hoped to turn its military success into a commercial win by building a plane as grand as an ocean liner. The idea was ambitious, but the execution fell short. Instead of using new technology, Boeing relied on outdated parts from its wartime aircraft. That decision proved costly. The engines were unreliable, the design was inefficient, and the plane quickly fell behind newer, better competitors. The Stratocruiser had potential, but it was built for the past while the rest of the industry moved forward. The Boeing 377 Stratocruiser is a perfect example of how bold ideas don't always lead to success. It aimed high with its luxury features and grand design, but constant engine troubles and high costs brought it down. It never became the game-changer Boeing had hoped for, but it's still a fascinating piece of aviation history. A reminder that even failures can teach us something. If you enjoyed this story, hit that subscribe button for more deep dives into aviation's biggest hits and misses, and let us know in the comments. Was the 377 a bold misstep, or just ahead of its time? If you've ever flown on an Airbus A380, you were cruising faster than a Formula One car, over 900 kilometers per hour, while seated inside a double-decker plane longer than two adult blue whales. It's a masterpiece of modern engineering. And today, you will find out exactly how it's built from the ground up. The Airbus A380 didn't just break records, it shattered expectations for commercial airliners. Stretching 72.7 meters long with a wingspan of 79.8 meters, almost as wide as a football field. Inside, it can carry up to 853 passengers in an all-economy layout, or around 555 in the more common three-class setup, more than the population of some small towns. Building this sky giant is a monumental task. Each A380 is assembled from over 6 million parts sourced from more than 30 countries. The materials used are cutting edge. 25% carbon fiber reinforced plastic, advanced aluminum alloys, and glass fiber composites make up the structure. Over 500 kilometers of wiring run through the fuselage, linking systems, sensors, and entertainment units. Even the internal pressure system is an engineering feat. At cruising altitude, the cabin is pressurized to simulate 8,000 feet above sea level, protecting passengers from the harsh, near-vacuum environment outside. Each of its four engines inhales about a ton of air per second, all while cruising above the clouds at near supersonic speeds. That's power and precision in perfect sync. The Airbus A380 is so massive that it couldn't be built in just one place. Like assembling a mansion mid-air, each A380 starts as an international puzzle with thousand-ton pieces. The front section and cockpit are built in France and Germany. 
The giant 50-meter wings come from Wales. The tail is made in Spain and the engines come from either Rolls-Royce in the UK or Engine Alliance in the US. But here's the tricky part. These pieces are huge, too big to fit in normal cargo planes. So Airbus had to get creative. They designed special transport systems just to move the parts. That includes the Beluga XL, a cargo plane shaped like a whale, and custom-built sea barges that carry the pieces along rivers and oceans. Then in France, they use a convoy of trucks to drive the parts along a special route called the Itinéraire à Grand Gabarit. To make that route work, Airbus literally widened roads, reinforced bridges, and even moved street signs just so these giant airplane parts could reach the final assembly line in Toulouse. It's one of the most impressive logistics operations in aviation history. And here's a quick question for you. How many Airbus A380 were built in total before production ended? Drop your best guess in the comments as we'll reveal the real number right before the outro. Once all the parts arrive in Toulouse, the real magic begins. This is where the A380 finally starts to look like an airplane. And it's as complex as building a space shuttle. Giant cranes and robotic arms lift the massive fuselage sections into position. Laser-guided systems make sure everything lines up perfectly, down to fractions of a millimeter. Each wing is attached with 30,000 rivets, and every single bolt is manually inspected. First, they connect the nose, center, and tail sections. Then comes the landing gear, 22 tons of steel and titanium, with 20 wheels to handle the A380's takeoff weight of over 560,000 kilograms. The wings are so wide they won't even fit through regular airport hangars. That's why installation demands extreme precision, measured in micrometers. Once the frame is in place, the aircraft moves to the fitting hall. This is where the interior comes to life. Engineers install everything from oxygen systems and pressurization controls to thousands of seats, in-flight entertainment, and the A380's famous dual staircases connecting both decks. All of this takes around 12 weeks and more than 1,500 engineers just to get the aircraft ready for testing. Every Airbus A380 flies with four of the most powerful jet engines ever put on a passenger plane. Depending on the model, it's either the Rolls-Royce Trent 900 or the Engine Alliance GP7200. Each one produces up to 80,000 pounds of thrust. And to put that into perspective, that's enough power to pull eight fully loaded freight train cars per engine. At full throttle, each engine sucks in over 1.25 tons of air every second. That air is compressed, ignited, and blasted out the back at speeds approaching Mach 0.85. That's nearly the speed of sound. Inside, these engines are marvels of precision. Before installation, each unit goes through X-ray inspections, vibration tests, and full power simulations to catch even the tiniest flaw. Once mounted under the wing, they're synced to the A380's fly-by-wire system, a high-tech digital control setup where the pilot steers using an electronic joystick, not mechanical cables. Even better, the plane has backup computers that take over instantly if something goes wrong, within milliseconds. And yet, thanks to these engines, this 560-ton giant lifts off like it's weightless. These engines help it climb, cruise, and land with the agility of something far smaller. Before a single passenger steps on board, every A380 must prove it's ready for the skies. And that means months of intense testing, both on the ground and in the air. It starts with ground tests. Engineers bend the wings, shake the fuselage, and blast the aircraft with high-pressure water jets to simulate extreme weather. One dramatic test involves the A380 roaring down the runway at full throttle but staying on the ground. Why? To check how the brakes, suspension, and tires handle high-speed stress without taking off. Then comes the real challenge, the maiden flight. Airbus test pilots take the aircraft into the air and push it to the edge of its performance envelope. They test maximum speed, altitude changes, stall recovery, engine response, and more, all in tightly controlled airspace. The first ever A380 flight in 2005 lasted just under four hours and everything went according to plan. Once all systems pass inspection, the plane is painted in the airline's colors like Emirates, Qantas, or Singapore Airlines and officially handed over. From the first part being built to the moment it joins an airline fleet, the process takes about one full year per aircraft. That's one year to build one of the most advanced flying machines in the world. 
The Airbus A380 started as a bold dream to build something even bigger and more luxurious than the Boeing 747. In the early 2000s, Airbus set out to create the world's largest passenger plane. But it wasn't just about cramming in more seats. The A380 aimed to redefine air travel. Think lounges, onboard bars, and even showers in first class. It was like turning an airplane into a flying hotel. The A380 made its first commercial flight in 2007 with Singapore Airlines and quickly became a symbol of long-haul luxury. Airlines like Emirates, Qantas, and Lufthansa added it to their fleets, but it came with challenges. Many airports around the world had to upgrade their runways, expand gate areas, and retrain staff just to handle the size of this beast. And about that question we asked earlier, how many Airbus A380 were built in total before production ended? The answer is just over 250. That's right. Only 251 Airbus A380s were ever produced before the line shut down in 2021. While that number was far lower than Airbus originally hoped, the A380 still made a massive impact on aviation history. It redefined long-haul luxury, turned heads at every airport, and became an icon in the skies. Emirates alone operates more than half of the entire global fleet. And even though production officially ended in 2021, the A380 continues to fly today, carrying passengers in comfort aboard one of the most remarkable machines ever made. It may not have lasted forever, but the A380 proved that sometimes bigger really is better. The Airbus A380 isn't just a plane, it's a masterpiece of global engineering. Even after production ended, the A380 still rules the skies as a symbol of what's possible when we aim higher, literally. If you found this video useful, hit subscribe for more epic tech and engineering breakdowns, and drop your thoughts in the comments. See you in the next one.